person. But I hope you feel proud of what I'm going to show. Obviously, it's my personal perspective. We can share ideas afterwards. But I, I hope you feel identified with what you are going to see next. So my talk tonight, so today, is going to be about the recent history of my city and the part of my personal professional experience in the, in the past few years. And in particular, the role that spaces, parks, and what we call social urbanism had to do in this transformation, or, or, or what we call our transformation as a city. You will be judging that in a few minutes. This is my beloved community, a beautiful sunset. Our skyline are the mountains of the Colombian Central Andes. Uh, down here you'll see the Library Park Spain, which is going to be a protagonist, one of the protagonists of this talk. Uh, and uh, about Medellin, 3.5 million inhabitants, uh, the second largest Colombian city, a very complex, exciting history, and uh, a, first of all, a qualification. In Spanish-speaking America, we call many things parks. Maybe what you call squares, what you call classes, we also call them parks. And in Medellin, I'm very happy to say that I was reading the Carver's entrance <laughs> of, the, of the whole, and I fully endorse them. I, uh, I fully agree with those guiding principles. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. You'll, you'll feel identified with them. So, and in Medellin, we are broadening that process even more, because you'll, you'll see that we call parks things that we will say, that's a building. That's right. That's a health center. But we call them parks. Because parks for our, are places for encounter and coexistence. Depends on our context, and you will see that next. A brief history of Medellin. Uh, it was founded by the Spanish 400 years ago, that's the 2nd of February, but it only became relevant as a city at the end of the 19th and in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, this was a uh, map of Medellin at the end of the 19th century, almost a village. I think we had like less than 30. 40,000 inhabitants at the end of the 19th century. But, and in the first half of the 20th century, we were called the industrial capital of Colombia. We had an incredible growth in the economic, the urban, and other perspectives. I have this copy of the National Geographic magazine of 1942. The reporter was saying that Medellin was for him something like Manchester in Latin America. At the time, Manchester was looking good. <laughs> <laughs> and these were the image the images that identify our city, a successful city uh, in the Colombian and Latin American countries at the time. Textile factories, steel factories, beverage companies, banks, cement, whatever, but, I haven't told you this. but eventually something happened. Fear came to see. A uh, local intellectual says that the mixture of what was happening in the global arena, changes of the uh, ideological and mental revolution in the 1960s and added that to the surge of the Colombian armed conflict, the foundation of the leftist guerrillas, mm -hmm. and also the poverty in the countryside and the, uh, the accelerated growth that had generated in Medellin for many decades, uh, generated up, ah, and remember, our entrepreneurial spirit. Remember that? And on the other hand, we were not able to have like an empire of the law, like a civic like ethics that replaced the role of the Catholic Church that in the first half of the 20th century and in many, many Latin American countries had this role of being so close to the state that it had the role of like consoling or educating the population. But we couldn't manage to have like a, like a civic ethics. So what happened? Entrepreneurship, no empire of the law, so fear came into scene. This is like a synthesis of Medellin. By the way, I have nothing to do with, with that with that print. <laughs> we, we shared the last name, but it, it's a very common last name. Just in case any, anyone was wondering. And that was the the most common image of Medellin, slums, informal settlements. When the famous architects and planners, Biller and Cert, came to Medellin in 1951, they thought that Medellin would, would have a population of approximately 750,000 in 1975, and we had one and a half million. We doubled that number. So that brought us a lot of problems. And this was the cover of the same magazine, National Geographic magazine in the late 90s, I think. Ultra State, Medellin, Stories of an Urban World. And this was the nicest picture because others had that people in it. If you, if you want to know about 
what, what's happening in a society, I would recommend, strongly recommend, that you look at the art that are producing, rather than the history books. And this was our art in the 80s and the 90s. Our most uh, iconic movie, Rodrigo de la Futuro, the story of kids, members of gangs in poor neighborhoods, and literally means Rodrigo, the protagonist, had no future at all. He was either poor and isolated or a member of the criminal groups. And our book, we were not born as a city, on sicarios. You know what a sicario is? Hitmen, people that live, make up their living out of killing people. Written by Alonso Salazar, who fortunately a great man, a social investigator, who fortunately got to get to be mayor of Medellin in the future. Amazing, no? And this is like in one picture what happened in the 2000s, in the decade of the 2000s. You know who Fernando Botero is? Fernando Botero is a Colombian painter and a sculptor, world, worldwide famous. He makes these sculptures on voluptuous people, voluptuous fruits, musical instruments, uh, sexy people. Uh, and he gave to the city this sculpture of a pigeon. Pigeon is the symbol of peace in our country in the late eight, uh, 1980s. But we had a terrorist attack in that same park who killed, destroyed the sculpture and killed, I think, less than 10 people and many, many others got injured. So in the early 2000s, when we were like managing to tackle those challenges, the city gave, gave us a new sculpture. But his condition that is, was that we have the new sculpture just beside the old one, like twins. We have a memory in our past and never, never repeat it again. And this is the most well known symbol of our Medellin today. That's a library park. That's a cable car that connects the formerly most violent and poorest neighborhood of our city. The symbol of that, of that neighborhood now is a library park. And this is the kind of art we are producing or inspiring now. This was written by a Spanish writer who got a prize out of it. It's the story of two kids. But now, these two kids that live close to that library part of Spain were stealing books out of the library to give them to, his, to their uh, stepfather, who was an alcoholic, and needed the money to buy more liquor. But eventually, after stealing the books for a few weeks or months, I don't know, they began to let them. And they fell in love with literature. And the end, the, at the end of the book, you'll see them looking at the city and having hope and thinking what they will do in the future. Now they do have a future. Mm. Of course, upon hope, we recover our old industrial self -team. Now, no, it's not industrial, that's a different kind of self -team, but we needed that as a city. And that part of that, at least, came out uh, from a uh, an um, impressive, I would call it like that, program of public works. Each of them, of them, full of the words culture, education, entrepreneurship, science and technology, sometimes sports as well. And these are the buildings and parks we have now in Medellin. So the, the four red boxes, that's our science park and museum. The green area below is our botanical garden park. This is our, our entrepreneurship and innovation park. It's the seed of our being our, our small Silicon Valley. This is where our economy of the future is being created. Uh, this, can be, this neighborhood can be considered all itself a park. And we got the Carrystone Prize of Design. I think it, it has, it, it's from the University of Harvard. And they didn't give us a uh, prize of design because of a beautiful building. They gave us a prize of design because the program of integral interventions in a neighborhood that complex, like the one, I'm going to explain this later. And this was the, the prize, the City Foundation. I'm sorry, Mary said, if you have a prize from TV, we can, get <laughs> we, we, can, we can be part of it. So the City Foundation gave us the prize of the most innovative city in the world. And we were competing with two very famous city, cities. New York City, you know that? Yes. And Tel Aviv. And they gave us the prize, not because we are a perfect city, we are not at all a perfect city. We have tons of challenges. We still are violent, unequal, we still, as any other city, we have problems. 
but we found a way, an innovative, innovative way, to solve our problems in transport, in coexistence, in education. So they gave us this Friday thing because of our resiliency and creativity as a city. Well, what happened? Let's look at some of those works. This is a park by the library park Spain called Santo Domingo. This is a library park where formerly different gangs were dropping the uh, bodies of the dead people they after their fights. This is the Leon de Grave, uh, great, uh, our greatest poet. That, that's what my father would say, because he, he used it to, to, to comfort my, my mother. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Leon de Grave, which is built over the plot where the old jail, the male jail, jail was. This is San Cristobal, that house now uh, less symbolic, but also a very beautiful sculpture from Fernando Otero, a nice lazy cat. <laughs> and this is a, a library park as well in the Comuna 13 San Javier. The other, the second, the second more violent commune or neighborhood, and that's the metro station and the cable car station. We now have three cable cars and two more on the way. That's the uh, Belen Library Park. It was built in uh, by an alliance between local architects and architects from the University of Tokyo. Do you see the Japanese? No? Okay. This is an amazing school. Each school is the most beautiful school in the world because having a nice school sends a powerful message to a community that education is the most important thing to, to have in a neighborhood. More schools, kids at school. This is our sports uh, center facility. We hosted the South American Games in 2010. And for us, that moment was the moment to celebrate, let me call it like this, like our graduation as a modern complex uh, with still problems, but a modern society. So we use this event to gather all together as citizens and celebrate that moment. This is how, how you soccer court. This, is, this, this gives, gives me the opportunity to invite you to be in Medellin. We have a, our, our, we are in the 20s, Celsius, all year round. <laughs> so feel, feel yourself invited. This is a neighborhood, formerly, that's a creek, Preoccupied, you see the rubbish, you see the informal settlements, not to talk about the risk of these, uh, of a flood and what would happen to these people in these houses. And after a process of participatory building and participatory discussion on the content and on the designs of the park, this is what happened to that neighborhood. And now we are applying this same model to neighborhoods across the city. This is uh, what you saw before, this is an amusement park, our science park, our botanical park, our planetarium, our, we call it wishes park, and this is the center of the botanical garden. I will stay loud. I, I always tell a terrible joke here. My girlfriend hates it because I got married here. I shouldn't show this place because it brought me bad luck. I got divorced. <laughs> but it's still it's one of the nicest places in Medellin. And it's where we have our most important social events, corporate events, and where we have our orchid exhibition of the year. And this is another cable car, our second cable car. Look, the City Foundation pointed this out. These are electrical ladders, but they are not taking you to a shopping mall. They are taking you to a neighborhood. They are connected to the metro, to the cable cars, and they are helping people that have to walk through very long and numerous stairs to get to their houses. And you imagine taking your groceries, they don't have roads, they have to walk uphill. So now some of those neighborhoods have these electric lights. And this is our farm. We inaugurated it last December. And it's going to be connected to two new cables, cable cars that go upstairs and it's connected to the metro. This is our whole transportation system. Uh, the metro has a backbone, a BRTs, uh, serving other neighborhoods, the tram, the four cable cars, or five cable cars, public bikes, similar to those you have. Uh, and this picture only rather because I love it. <laughs> this is a bridge park. Yes, it is a bridge and it is a park. It connects, it's a wide pedestrian bridge, not just to cross, but to stay, to enjoy, enjoy, to feel in love. To enjoy, and I think the most beautiful sunset, or the second most beautiful after the first I, I showed, is from this bridge park. 
and it has parts on both sides. And the, the most profound thing is that this bridge part connects two communities. We have one bank, one, one gang, the Triana, and another gang, the Terrazzo members, on this side. And it was almost impossible to cross that bridge if you were allowed by a, a formal permission of illegal groups. Now we have people, kids from both sides, getting in love. It is not only about the bridge part, I mean, it's, it's a more complex intervention. I'll go a little bit about that next. But the bridge comes and sends a message. This is a prominent for us in a park. When we came to this place, we found the cable car, the first cable car. There were less than 10 businesses, small businesses. And now we have more than, we have more than 300 businesses. And the nightlife is amazing. If you go to Medellin because of the weather, you should come here because of the music. <laughs> This is an old picture from the 1980s that was our old open sky dumpster. Do you like it? No. But would you, would you like to live up there? Of course not. It's dangerous. But you see, we got like 10,000 people living over the rubbish. And now this is an environmental park. And behind that park, you will find this cultural center, which was built by the designs of the most famous Colombian architect. Were, that were donated by a private foundation. Most than, more than half of the building, I think, was donated by that foundation. Sending the message that the corporate and private foundations were open to work and were open to connect with people that uh, live in the most stymied neighborhood of the city. If you live there, you wouldn't put your, in the past, you wouldn't put your, the name of your neighborhood on your resume. You will change it because they will think you live in your rubbish pit. That's what you say. And we also have actual parks, like your park. This is our natural park. You can access it by a cable car um, up till the Santo Domingo Library Park. It's a large uh, 5,600 acres park with uh, a couple of hotels, lagoons, an amusement park, trails, bike trails whatever. Mm. And usually many of my fellow local politicians with their big ego, they and hear their talk and wait for an applause. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> because I think that um, up to this point, I only demonstrated that we are quite a bunch of constructors of schools, libraries, and other great places. That's, that's fine. And maybe you want to know where I did, did I get the money. You can ask that afterwards. But or the difficulties we have. But I think, am I demonstrating that the city actually changed? Let's look at some figures, okay? Oh, no, first, let's give you, let, let me give you some context. And I brought this little story, sentence I love, quote that I know, I love. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family are unhappy in its own way. By this I mean that every city, every problematic city has different problems. And you have to understand that context, that's 101 like management, before you come out with a group of solutions or projects or programs. And this was our context, graphically represented. Two trees, intertwined roots, soil. One tree, one tree, illegality. Sorry, one tree, violence. The other, inequality. The soil, culture of illegality, corruption, if you like to call it like that. So the roots are together. That was our problem. We were not solving. Okay, no. this, this, maybe this wasn't my last version as well, but I'll tell you for the presentation. Against violence. So we decided the formula against violence, encounter and culture, against inequality, education from a white perspective, beyond school, in the public space, in the family, everywhere, and against illegality, teaching by example. Remember, I see that. We were not solving a public health problem or our obesity problem, or an economic problem. I respect when a city creates parts for those problems, but our problems were different. And uh, our solutions have to be designed accordingly to that. Let's look at some figures. This is what happened to the homicide rate per 100,000 inhabitants in 18. 91, 2014. Yesterday, uh, uh, in the planning department of the city of Toronto, they were telling me that you were below two percent, below two in that same indicator. So we still have a long way ahead of us. But we are doing much better than at least 10, 10 that I know American cities. And most of Latin American 
category. And this is what happened to the Human Development Index, which gives you like an, a comprising idea of the quality of our housing, our access to the education, and our access to health. 20 something percent of improvement in less than IP. In IP, we doubled our tertiary education coverage. That means that our kids that get out from high school, they have future. One out of two has the possibility to study at the university. The others have the possibility of getting technical education. I remember, uh, I told you about a, free, a few headlines in different media. This Sunday, 2007, I was reading the New York Times. And imagine what? That it was not in the Americas section with a crime story. Medellin was in the travel section. They were inviting everyone to come to Medellin. But still, I show you a story, a few figures, a few facts, but you want to take it. Freshness. Politics matter. Mm. Whether you like it or not, politicians make the most important decisions in a society. Better if you participate, better if you help them, better, better if you want other politician. I, I don't like that anymore, but I, I respect it. And this was the guy who led us, a mathematician, a member of the academia. He led us a group of independent people from the cultural areas, from the academia, from the business sectors. In the most dire uh, moment of our city, he led us into uh, the creation of a political independent movement. And that was part of the solution. Not all of it, of course. And then we had this model. I kind of told you about it. More legality, teaching by example, less violence. That's not only about public works, of course. It was all about the police, the justice system, and, and in general, intervention again. More education from a wider perspective, and more of what we call changing the skin. Changing the skin is creating great places, great spaces, great parks, where formerly we had fear and hatred. You know the, the lives of some snakes that change their skin to get into a new stage in their life? And these are the seven concepts we use to support the idea of social urbanism. Do you agree that every urbanism should be social with me? Do you think? But some, for, for some people, urbanism is economic or aesthetic. Uh, or just for the ego of the politician. <laughs> Organization should, should be, that's my way of looking, seeing at it, always social. The seven concepts are framing, choosing where to intervene. You cannot change the whole city at the same time. Confluence, doing integrally with different inter interventions, education, culture, parks, health centers, uh, centers for supporting uh, development of new enterprises. Uh, the, the next is connection. In that sense, the transportation system goes much farther than connecting you to your job. Connects you to your fellow citizens and to neighborhoods you, you have never visited before. And it generates visibility. I, I'm going to tell a, a short uh, anecdote about visibility later. Quality and beauty. You could call that good design, quality design. But w what we say is, the most beautiful places for the homeless people, for, for the poor. And the next is healing the skin of the city, vaccinating the city against violence. We know that spaces and places and great parks don't fight by themselves alone violence, but they help. Because if, if you as, as a society have the opportunity to, to encounter, to see each other in the eye, you will be able to respect each other in the future. The next one is leadership and community, and the final one is institutional sustainability. Every space has to be sustainable. This is an example of framing. This is the map of Medellin. We chose the poorest and the most violent neighborhoods, and there's where we intervene. This is framing, like in photography. This is an example of all of them. You see the library park Spain, you see the cable car, you see the bridge, the orange bridge, and the housing projects. This is an example of framing. We chose an area of less than 200,000 inhabitants. We decided to have confluence of different interventions. We have, in that same area, we have uh, several schools, health centers, public spaces, transportation, everything. 
connection because you are connecting this neighborhood to the city. I remember the first time I went to Santo Domingo, just by the library, an old woman said to me, I'm very happy because of the cable car, so now I am going to be able to visit Medellin. And I was like, what? You live in Medellin? She didn't feel part of the city. So that's, that needs connection. And visibility is the way around. I remember when we did the summit for the Chambers of Commerce of all Colombia in Medellin. You know where we did the meeting? Out there. We invited the most powerful business people of the country to make visible this neighborhood. And then quality, I told you, in leadership, we had a, a manager for this whole program of projects. Uh, this story I told you about. And this is what happened in that neighborhood with the social urbanism intervention, comparing it with other neighborhoods, very similar in the, at the beginning, not exactly equal, but very similar in the same period. This is what happened to homicides. The orange one are the intervening neighborhoods. And this is what happened to something I value a lot, is the reliance on the police. It almost doubled. Not that the police did something different. They did a good job working with the community. But the quality of spaces and the, the, the size of intervention generated this kind of trust. This is the Explora Science Museum on Park. And it is, despite of the investment being from the municipality, a successful non-profit. It has sustainability. It is now run by the private sector in an alliance, a TPP, you will call it. These are the parts I showed you before, but I didn't tell you that we had this promenade connecting them, these parts to downtown. That's feasibility. That's connection. And this is, I told you that this uh, library park, this is a uh, nice view was built over the old plot of the Mayo's jail. And now we have this network of libraries and library parks. And this is uh, the result of a workshop where we decided to design, uh, all together with the community of Santo Domingo Sabio, or another table below it, the, an, a water park. They, they have pools, they have kiosks, they have uh, uh, fountains, things like that. Also, the Botanical Garden is a successful non-profit. We made an investment at the City Hall, but now it's sustainable. It's a 10 million American dollar organization per year. They get more than 3 million visitors per year. And behind this cultural center I told, I showed before, we have participation. More than 90% of the content was decided by the African Colombian community that lives around. And they are also part of this tripod of administration with on one side the city hall, on the other an NGO, and on the other side the community, on the board. But we also made mistakes. Many mistakes, but right? just one, because I don't want to, well, I don't know. <laughs> I want you to, to, I want my fellow citizen to feel proud. This is a housing project we did uh, outside the city, like in the suburbs. Uh, no occidental. Um, here we didn't apply any of the seven concepts. We didn't have a cable car connecting it, it but it was, it, it was no habitat. There were only houses, small apartments, no schools, no parks, no spaces, no leadership, no confluence, no integrality, nothing. And now we're dealing with a profound social problem and security problem here. We have, I think, 50 thousand people living in those buildings and they are having well, all the problems you can, you can imagine. So we are learning how to our mistakes. Finally, I show you a lot of interventions, spaces, places, but don't mistake social urbanism but by any of these elements, cable cars, bike lanes, large parts, iconic public buildings, or scattered small uh, public spaces, or pseudo participatory urban renewal. Uh, or educational facilities, uh, I love schools, but they isolated, don't make social organizations. This tells me we both are begging you to remember, if you <laughs> can only remember one thing of, of my talk, remember that it, it is all about community. It is about training, understanding where to work. It is about context, understanding which problems are you solving. It, it is about healing, not wiping out. It is about beauty, and I use the word beauty because I'm not an artist. We we'll call it, some artists will, will say good design. They say beauty. Uh, it is about connection, both ways. 
It is about integrality. And uh, it is about, at the end, about people. Especially youngsters, especially girls, which for me, for us, are the basis of the whole. Thank you so much.